give Eric a warm, dry welcome. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. I appreciate that. Thank you. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Good. Um, I'd like to just kind of get an idea of where you folks are from. You know, let's, let's get to know each other because if you're going to listen to me sit, sit here and spiel on a little bit, um, it might be good that we get to know each other. How many people here are um, IT professionals? Okay, it looks like the majority of people are IT folks. Okay, good. Um, how many people are more in the analysts? And there, you, may, you may cross over some of these things. How many people are analysts? Okay, so we've got analysts and IT mix. Um, uh, how many people are fundraisers? Okay, got one fundraiser here. <laughs> That's good. Um, how many people are managers and decision makers for your organization? It's a good number. Okay, good. And how many people here are vendors? Okay, good. Um, so I think I fit a little bit in kind of any, every one of those categories to a degree, you know, and I've less vendor these days because I'm more working for Penn State full time. Um, but uh, you know, give you a little bit of background about me. I'm I'm a uh, I'm a drive attendee, so that's uh, that's who I am, like you. So I'm here to enjoy the conference. I was here last year, and the reason why I'm up here before you to speak is because. Last year I went to the conference and you know, I really took it in. Uh, I was there to get some best practices. Um, came to Seattle. You gotta love Seattle. Um, you know, I don't know if you, any of you have been to the dumpling shop up, uh, dumpling restaurant across the walkway. Ooh, good stuff, isn't it? Yeah. So I recommend that if you haven't had that experience. Um, got to go to Pike's Market with a couple colleagues. Had a good time. You know, so that's the fun of being here, right? We're, we're here for a little bit of a break, but also some work. Um, and to take in information. And this is a really great place. We've got all these great vendors here. We're not here just to be um, numbers on the UW's database as attendees to the conference, because we're gonna wind up there probably, right? Um, but you know, I, I think one of the things I, I came here last year for was to benchmark a little bit. Where, where do I fit in? You know, uh, who, who are my colleagues? What, what are people doing that's like what I'm doing? And um, so you know, I walked around and introduced myself. Hey, I'm Eric, Program Area Analyst State College. Or Penn State uh, University um, and you know got to meet a lot of people and collected some cards and all that, that good stuff that we do at conferences um, but the, I went to this one presentation and I'm just like you know I, I'm a custom programmer I actually develop develop applications for my department so I'm, I'm like I'm trying to find people who are similar and I didn't I had a really hard time finding people who are doing the kind of work that I'm doing um, so I went to uh, this one presentation and this uh, this presenter um, she did a really good job of talking about like getting all your data sources up front, you know, um, getting all your your pieces of data together and um, doing like a really comprehensive cover sheet. And I don't know if anybody went to that last year. It was a really kind of a neat, neat presentation. It just made you think of all the elements that are involved before you actually go and build something, right? And we can all, I think I can use some tuning with that you know, from time to time. So, um, but while I was there, a couple people, um, two, two people actually wound up complaining about their annual giving departments. And so I worked for the Penn State Office of Annual Giving. Um, they, they raised their hands, they're just like, so what happens if if uh, we have all these, you know, we have, we got people who want all this custom need, they always want something different. And we're trying to do things on a, on a mass level, we're trying to make sure that we're getting things out for, for people to consume. How do we handle all these outliers? So the, uh, you know, the one, one person who literally complained just said, you know, our annual giving office is just really a problem because they just want all this data all the time. They don't know what they want. They just want something new all the time. So how do we keep up with that? How do we develop with that? And um the person presenting the uh, presenting the uh, session, she was like, "Well, you, know, you could hire a dedicated annual giving programmer, you know. That, but who's got the who's got the resources for that? You know, who's got the funds for that? Um, and you could, uh, you know, you could develop applications, but you know that takes a that just uh, if you're going to de dedicate that kind of time, it's it's a big waste." You know, it, you're, you're, it doesn't seem like that would be um, worthwhile doing. So you've got to try to steer them to your processes. So afterwards, raise my hand. You know, so I'm like, hey, um, I'm a dedicated uh, programmer for the annual giving office at Penn State. So all eyes turned on me, you know, and uh, it was a little, little bigger session than this. So there, were, I think there were probably about 80 people in that session. It was a large size session. So everybody was looking at me and I'm like, so, you know, do you have any, any tips or, or recommendations? You're saying legacy is an issue with what I'm, I'm doing. Do you have any, any recommendations there? And she just 
literally didn't look me in the eye, put her head down and said, no, you're screwed. So here I am before you, screwed. <laughs> Um, happily screwed because I love my job. So, um, I, so you know, it just made me think. I've got a, a, a bone to pick with that. So here I am. I'm, I'm here, a little chip on my shoulder from last year. Um, but uh, also to kind of talk about some some IT perspectives, and I think she illustrated a point. Right? We uh, we're trying to serve people and give some good solutions, but. You know, needs are pretty agile, and I think as time changes and as, as you know, more, integra or more integrations coming out and more technologies uh, becoming available, it's going to be more of a challenge for all of us. We're going to have to come up with some good arguments. We're going to have to think about how to stay agile. We're going to have to work with our vendors for some of those solutions and, and learn to negotiate better. You know, so there, there's, a, there's some real challenges. And, okay, and I'll further tell you about myself, too. Um, the person standing before you is wrong. I'm wrong, okay? Just have to say I'm wrong, but I do things in the right way. So what I mean by that is um, I come from Pennsylvania, a very small town where they hunt and fish. I don't hunt and fish, so I'm kind of not a match for where I come from. Um, see, I played guitar in a punk band when I was younger. Um, I, I have an English creative writing degree. So here I am, a programmer standing before you with an English creative writing, writing degree. So you know, I've never done anything kind of the way it's supposed to go. My life has never gone the way it's supposed to go. Uh, my mother was greatly relieved when I got a job that paid me money. You know, she's very happy. Um, so, you know, um, that's, that's who you're getting advice from. So when you go back to your offices and you say, you know, hey, this guy was talking about we need to develop agile solutions, then you can go back and, and say, uh, uh, you know, uh, they'll say, who is that guy? And you'll say, well, he played in a punk band and, you know, he, he's got an English degree. So, so there you go. I'm going to give you all sorts of tools to go back and make some good arguments. Um, so with that, let's get into my, my uh, presentation. And so, you know, uh, I take a little bit of, of ribbing for what I do. Um, and um, I, I take that from um, some IT people who put out a lot of solutions. And... Uh, I, I, so this, that's what this is about. I build monsters. You know, nobody wants to admit that that um, building a custom solution is, is necessarily a good option. But I'm here to say it, it. Sometimes it's the only option. Sometimes it's a good temporary option. So you can actually look at that in different levels and think about how you want to scale that or think about that. Um, uh, some, and, I, and I would argue that it's definitely necessary to understand programming and the way that your vendors are developing their applications to effectively negotiate with them. And that's a big thing that I, I, I see is lacking. Um, so without further ado, I'll get into my presentation here. Um, so what's the definition of a program? Um, it's a plan of things that are done in order to achieve a specific result. So uh, by that definition, we're all programmers. You know, um, and we all, we all, you guys made the steps to come to this office. You might have grabbed some coffee on the way and had that as part of your programming plan for, for showing up here. Um, but in our human experience, we, you know, we, we do the same thing. We, we build our experience um, from our sensory experience. Uh, we, we distort, delete, and generalize like applications do. We do all those things. So I just want you guys to bear with me for a minute. And for the uh, technical folks here, this might be a little too hippy-dippy, but, but stick with me here. Um, I want you to think of something that you've done for your organization, something you've done for other people that you know that has been positive. Just think of an, of an example. One thing that you've brought, maybe a technology that you've brought, a, um, uh, a, 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 something you did that was uh, solving a problem for your organization, some point of service that you've done for somebody. You know, think of one thing. So bear with me. And while you do that, I want you to take your thumb and rub your knuckle. And think of that moment. Now think of how, you know, think of the people that were around you during that time. Think of who was, was present. And take that in and, and uh, think of uh, what the sights and sounds were. And so I'm just going to give you a second to think, you know, relish that moment that you had, that, that moment of triumph, that good feeling that you had. Rub your knuckle. Okay. Okay, got a few people playing along, so that's good. <laughs> um, um, okay, so from there, I, I want you to actually recite back your phone number ba uh, backwards, using your area code too. So, so take your whole phone number, start and recite it backwards. So stop rubbing your knuckle, and just, just take your phone number and recite it backwards. Okay. So, so the point of that is just to kind of wipe that out, right? Um, so 
the, the point of this, um, you know, so here I am blathering before you, um, and you know, everybody's here in Seattle and having a good time, but the point of this is now if you, if you take your thumb and you rub it against your knuckle, and you do it again, and you, you allow yourself to experience that, that, you know, that positive thing, that's, now you've created an anchor, right? And that's a programming trick. We create anchors, we create a reference point. So we can bring that back and use that. So that's just an example. You know, I don't have much to offer. I'm not like Buck Woody. I don't have any treats for everybody to come up front. Um, but um, you know, that's one of the things you, uh, you can take that home with you, right? And you know, if you can sell it, let me know because you know, we can work together and maybe kind of find a way to go on a tour and do this kind of thing. But anyway, um, getting back on track here. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a programmer. I do, um, you know, basically I'm a software architect. I do stuff in .NET and SQL mostly, right? Um, uh, with that, I have uh, relational databases that are part of the applications that I build. Um, so, but I would say I'm a creator of IT mutations and I am a mad scientist level creator because that's pretty much what I do all day long is create applications and I have nobody basically breathing down my neck on how I do it. Um, I have to adhere to you know, certain things that we do at Penn State. I have to you know, keep the policies and procedures but um, I was hired as a kind of an outlier. So I'm literally a dedicated person for my department. So I'm here as an oddball, I really am. You know, I'm not a vendor here, I'm not, a, uh, uh, I'm not here to sell you a platform. So custom programming is what I do. Um, and so some of the things that I've built for Penn State, just some examples are, uh, you know, I have an on online job application tracking system that I've done for our student call center. So that's an issue because we have up to 140 students that get hired per, per uh, semester down at our call center. So Penn State's a pretty big place, right? Um, I have a, uh, a, they actually eventually feed into a payroll system. So, um, uh, you know, one application kind of feeds in the other. Um, I have a, a contribution form maker that's imageable that gets scanned. And that looks up into our data warehouse and actually puts all the, the donor information and, and the asks and that kind of stuff right in the form. Um, stewardship data checking and vendor letter output. So that's one of the kinds of things that, that you know, if you have an intense stewardship program that has specific data that's, you know, that's part of that, um, I have a whole application that handles just, just one program. Uh, senior class gift pledge recording system. So I was able to create a pledge recording system. Uh, alumni brick locator. That's kind of like a little side job that I had, you know, uh, at Penn State. Um, big things, a project management system. Um, that's one of the things we use heavily. And um, there's a lot of out-of-the-box project management solutions that are, that are out there, but we really want, needed something custom. And that's actually how I came to Penn State, was, was um, you know, uh, helping out with, with their need uh, with solicitations. And then there's a uh, vendor output system, which is one of our bigger things. So um, generating our asks, sending our data to a vendor. And we literally have, uh, we're getting close to 1.8 million entity records at uh, Penn State. So it's a, it's a pretty big volume of data. Um, I think we're over, well over six million gifts. Um, so uh, the, the output system handles all that on demand. Um, so let's look at IT development and fundraising's agile needs. Uh, is custom programming right for my organization? Ways custom programming works and some rules and tips for legacy and putting IT exploration to a process. Uh, so here's the old school method, right? And I, I, I had to put this up here because this is what I'm experiencing when I work with other IT people a lot of times, it really is. Getting all your requirements up front, uh, getting your, you know, planning the design, the architecture, looking at the impl implementation, um, going through the verification process, and then going into maintenance mode. And sometimes these go into different phases where you might go back and revisit this for an application again, you know. But this is what I, I more often than not, I see this um, with a lot of the people that I work with. Um, so let's look at the positive attributes. You know, you have, uh, you have. Um, an input doorway, all the articulations required up front before moving on, it forces a deadline. Um, documentations, you know, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's easier because everything is known up front and it's pretty simple and disciplined. So if you analyze the waterfall, you know, other than it being a nice pretty waterfall, you, you also have uh, all the input you ever need up front, all the elements are known and fixed. Um, there's no change to anything affecting the applications over the life cycle and the entire life cycle can be predetermined in, in almost every facet before you start to do your build. So factors are known and input is required, right? Um, this is still important, you know, certainly in some of your phase work, but I think if you think this way and you're working with agile clients and people who have 
a lot of needs. Relationships don't work this way, you know? Um, so applications also don't work this way. They, they have to go through phases, and I think that's, that's you know, why I'm here, you know, really one of the reasons why I'm here. Um, so let's take fundraising. And at Penn State, we have major gifts, planned giving, corporate giving, and annual giving. Pretty much the first three are stewarded um, areas, and they um, involve prospect tracking and that kind of thing. But annual giving is kind of more like your general nonprofits, and you know it focuses on donor centricity. So it's a, it's always been this outlier. So you know I think there's a pretty heavy complaint about annual giving always wanting so much data and being hard to please. And at Penn State, annual giving is a big part of what we do. Um, so with donor centricity, let's just look at the, the elements of this, right? Gifts are not just cash transactions. Donors are not just interchangeable, easily replaceable credit cards and wallets. Any donor has the potential to grow the mission of your organization. It's no longer the single gift, but the lifetime value of the donor that counts and prompt acknowledgement and response to the donors is critical. Uh, donors are investing in good through your organization. So this is getting away from technical stuff, right? We're getting into, into some gray terms. Um, they expect their investments to prosper. Fundraisers are in the feel-good business, and donors uh, feel good when, when their gifts make a difference. Uh, we can earn a donor's trust by re reporting our accomplishments and efficiencies. Um, fundraising serves a donor's emotional needs as much as it does an organization's financial needs. And uh, why a donor responds to an appeal can only be best guessed. Um, if we hear directly from our donors, it gives us valuable insight. So that's, those are some kind of donor-centric principles. Um, so if you're seeing that compared to the waterfall, there's not much of a, of a match going on there. So um, donor you know, so let's an analyze that. Donor input will determine courses of action. Donor input will likely change overall strategy from time to time. Elements are not always clearly defined. Uh, relationships are key. Donors want to see impact. So um, factors change. Ongoing relational dialogue is required. And then if you look at what's going on with uh, the millennials, and of course there's a lot of buzz about that, whether they're even worth the time, that kind of thing. You know, we need to reach those younger donors because we want them into our pipeline, and we're looking at our average uh, major donor being age being around 70 at Penn State. You know, it's a, it's a pretty pretty uh, pretty much not an issue right now, but what, how are we going to keep these people in that pipeline? How are we going to keep them interested? So um, there's a great site called the millennialimpact.com that has kind of some of these stats and figures. Um, um, but you know, 83% of millennials use smartphones, you know, pretty standard. 75% uh, of millennials like, retweet, share content data on social media. So we're trying to figure out how we're going to reach them. And you see things like crowdfunding now that, that, that are happening and um, you know, kind of more social experiences with fundraising. Um, so some additional challenges are there's a heck of a lot of buzz going on right now, right? Big data. Um, so high demand, there's a higher demand for business intelligence, and we're hearing these from the people that we report to, right? They want this kind of stuff. Um, how many vendors here are doing business intelligence, you know, at this, at this conference? Quite a few. Uh, some with the same, offering the same, similar solutions. Um, there's a higher demand for predictive model, modeling. At Penn State, we're looking at doing test populations, which is something we're, we're working into. Uh, so that, that's pretty data intensive. Uh, higher demand for integrative technology, um, data stores talking to one another. So let's analyze that, right? Um, app development demand is growing. To reach young donors, it requires technologies they're using. Report development demand is growing. Data integration demand is growing. So summarize that, technical demands and data integration demands will continue to grow. Um, so let's compare our waterfall versus what's going on in the annual giving world. Uh, with the waterfall, the factors are known, the input's required up front, and in the annual giving world, the factors change, ongoing relational dialogue is required, and technical demands and data integration demands will continue to grow. I'm not here to say that custom programming is the answer to this stuff, but I'm saying it's, a, it's you know, it's, it's an option. It's a big part of what we do. And it's one of the ways that you're going to be able to stay agile until, you're, until things catch up with what, what's going on. Um, so, you know, agile development, I think, is more of a fit, is more of an answer. Um, it values more individuals and interactions. So in agile development, you know, self-organization and motivation are important. So if you're able to actually work with a client instead of looking at, you know, we're going to go through this phase and we're going to get up our requirements and we're going to build something. Instead, as you're doing that, you start to think, hey, what's, what's going to happen in the future? What's going to happen in five years? What's going to happen in two years? You know, what's going to happen when this thing doesn't work? Um, uh, uh, so you start to think of like 
uh, ways to actually, you know, things that, that your clients aren't thinking about necessarily. Um, working software is more the, the um, thing to, to look at because you want, you don't want to just come up with a, a diagram or a model or just show people, you know, paperwork uh, about what you're building. You, you want to actually show them a demo, right? So you want to get them in there to try that demo and then you want to rip that thing apart and you want to build it again as you, as you go. Um, uh, it, customer collaboration is important. So actually you can, um, you know, the requirements can't be fully uh, collected at the beginning of the software development cycle. So there's continuous customer stakeholder involvement is very important. So keep that the communication. It requires what I'm doing here today before you, you know, talking, talking to people, making it relational. Um, responding to change is important. Agile development is focused on quick responses to change, uh, to change and uh, continuous development. And testing will happen concurrently as you're building stuff. So this is pretty much the, the you know, basically I'm it, folks, you know, in my department. So I get to kind of, you know, you know, with, with the IT development. So I get to really think about how I'm going to do this. And I get, I get feedback from my colleagues whether I'm doing it effectively or not. And I try to, you know, think about that. But, but this is what I keep uh, in my mind as I build things. Um, so what happens if IT doesn't serve agile needs? And so these are some words of caution. Some of this is based on experience, okay? Annual giving is the start for major donations and should be taken very seriously. Annual giving serves all of your units and is the public face of fundraising. So if you ignore your annual giving office, you know, it's, it's, it's one of your bigger marketing things that are out there. Um, people in your organization may find their own ways to get what they want around you. That's a pretty scary notion, right? Um, people in your, furthermore, they may leverage the power of donors with clout who want change. And I don't know if we, I've seen that happen a few times, right? Um, people in your organization may leverage uh, the power of uh, the senior administrators and board members who want change. So you know, once, once a senior person wants it, I try to think somebody was talking about the, one of the presentations yesterday was talking about, um, you know, things working on a, on a phone, um, getting data on a phone. And he, he said that, you know, it's not so much the millennial use, it was when one senior administrator in the, in the organization wanted it on the phone, then all of a sudden <laughs> it was launched to that organization on the phone. So that's what I'm getting at with that point, you know. It just takes one person who really wants something um, that, and that may change your whole world. And you stand to lose control if you don't use, if, if others don't use your shop and they use alternative ways to get what they need. So that's a note of caution. I'm not saying you have to do everything they want. I'm definitely not saying that, but I'm saying be aware of these things and be aware of, of how your perception is set with these kind of things. So I'm on a big soapbox, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, what definitely does not help, obviously the Spanish Inquisition. Um, and, you know, shutting down input's not a good idea. Um, being overprotective of data. And you know, being protective of your data, that's a good thing, you gotta do that, right? But um, I think when your data goes more freely out to vendors than it does to, to people, other, other IT people in your organization, you might wanna think about that, you know? Um, not accepting your client expertise, just saying, hey, they don't, uh, they don't do, uh, you know, they don't know what the heck they're talking about. And, and you know, if they're in a specific area and they're tasked with that, you might know the IT idea behind what they do, but you've got to realize that they're, they're trying to come up with their own strategy and it's best to work with them the best you can. Um, and then don't hide behind the RFS, right? Um, so the request for service is a great tool. We all need that in our organizations. But the problem is when it becomes a black hole. So when, when, when somebody you're, you know, you're serving puts in that request and then all of a sudden they don't hear anything back from you, then that's a danger. I'm, I'm not saying not to use it, and I have some tips a little later on about that, um, about how to effectively use your RFS. But, um, you know, so some good ways to, de to actually handle agile development. Develop some teamwork strategies. Um, you know, uh, so I have a kind of a, a guided process a little bit later here. Um, I also have one that's um, under my, my own Frankenstein mug on my, uh, if you go to the Drive website and you find my bio, there's a little download link, it's a PDF that they put up there. So everything's green, so I didn't um, hit you with a, a whole pile of papers when you came in. But so you can download that if you want. It's all, it's, that stuff I got all from an executive coach who really knows what he's doing with teamwork stuff. So it's pretty valuable. Uh, I recommend uh, going there. Um, Hire vendors that are responsive and agree to your agile terms. So make that part of your initial no negotiation. You know, how, how much are we gonna be able to get in there and work to, you know, work with you to make this, this stuff flexible for, for our purposes? You know, are we gonna be able to build part, you know, procedures? So you look at all these BI tools that are coming out where, the, you know, where, where they're looking at denormalizing your data, right? They're talking about um, 
doing all this legwork for you, but how, how much are you going to be able to get in there and, and change those, um, those procedures, that kind of stuff on your own? And I think that's an important question. Uh, structure your organization and IT development to handle agile needs through programming. So again, this is my a recommendation or an area to look at. So what's an IT mutant? It's just something that, you know, it's just me kind of being a goof coming up with a term for what I do. And it's an application that uh, is the result of piecing together different technologies for an organizational need. Um, creating your own monsters may be a way to keep up with agile development needs uh, of your organization, but I think it's crucial when uh, when you're looking for solutions in-house and out-of-house to understand programming. So the worst thing, I think, is to actually look at um, specifications and not understand what, what the technologies are involved with, with your vendors. Um, so when does my organization need custom programmers? I would say when you don't understand what your vendors are saying, so liking, like having a car mechanic work on your car and you, you're not understanding what's under the hood, you run the risk of being overcharged or fed misinformation. I don't think that happens generally with reputable vendors, okay? But I've seen it happen actually with a, probably a couple smaller vendors from time to time. Um, you know, uh, having your, your staff understand vendor technology is really vi a vital thing. Um, you know, custom programming helps out when you have manual data cleanup processes, right? We all have that stuff. Um, when you have data sets that don't communicate well together. And some of that is growing. You know, we're getting all these web services now, so there's like all sorts of different areas where we're getting more data coming into what we're doing. Um, you have processes that need to be run on demand. I think that's a big one. So at Penn State, I have uh, the ones I built are the contribution forms, the vendor output system, and the, and the stewardship letters. So, um, see, uh, when your organization is rapidly growing and changing, custom programming helps. So I think this is a, this is a big one. So um, kind of leads to my next slide, which is uh, waiting in the client community. And I, I, I have this feeling sometimes when, I, when I'm working with vendors and they just say, wait till you find enough other people with a similar problem. That's what I feel like, right? Like I'm in a corral with a bunch of other cows <laughs> waiting for us to move loud enough about something that we want so that it can be developed. And that's not always the case. Um, but I will say it's a case certainly with a couple vendors that we've worked with. Um, and um, I usually try to find my way around it until I can get people to uh, play along. So I don't, like, I, don't want, I don't want vendors to hold up our process. You know, and, some, and a lot of times too, it's also, um, you might have one vendor that has one solution, right? And then you might have another vendor with another solution and you're just really wanting those relationships to come together and this vendor to work with that vendor. And um, there's nothing worse than sitting back and having them, the two duke it out. In most, in most cases, it, uh, from what I've seen, it doesn't form into a solid relationship even if you're kind of the driving force. It's pretty rare because they have different business models. They have different lawyers. They have different investors. You know, they, have, uh, they haven't thought through what, what, your, you know, what your issues are. So sometimes you have to actually build it Present it to them and look what we've done. You know, it's not, it's pretty ugly, but it works, you know, um, and let, let them know what you're planning on doing. So let's break custom programming into some levels. Um, and I would say that pretty much most organizations do at least this level, right? Your, your occasional patches. Um, how many people at least perform these occasional patches here? Uh, okay. Yep, good. <laughs> yeah, it's a, we all got to do that, right? It's pretty much, it's a, uh, you know, things don't always work as, as predicted, as planned. So, uh, you know, this might be just some basic SQL procedures that help you uh, integrate data, um, some server trigger tasks for importing and exporting, uh, and some light data cleanup, you know, access. A lot of people use access for this kind of work. Um, then the next level is pretty much your regular operations. So this is making custom, thinking about custom programming on a higher level, you know, taking it to your organization and thinking about it um, as part, as a routine part of what you do instead of just the basic patches. So, um, you know, these are these are the uh, SQL stored procedures that are are you know customized, not created in the user interface. Um, routine data integration, something you set up things, processes to run routinely. Um, use of uh, .NET, Python, or other user interfaces with the database relations. Um, in internet level development, some customized reports with SQL programming uh, delivery interfaces, and um, application development with the use of web services. So how many people do this level of work? Okay, still quite a few, okay, great. Um, and then the next level I would say, uh, oh, this one's not working. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. 
I broke it. <laughs> um, next level I have is mad scientist level. <laughs> um, and I think that's where you do, uh, there it goes, thank you, sir. Oh, that's okay. Um, you know, these are where you're coming up with your own proprietary processes. So like one of the ones we do at Penn State is a dynamic SQL. So we're building a user interface where the, serve, where the, the people can select the criteria that they want for our vendor output and then it, it produces the output and builds the SQL and strings. Um, public facing use of applications or large scale applications. So you know, I would say that UW went to this mad scientist with Michelangelo, right? They took it to a pretty, pretty far level. I'd say they're way past this, right? They're, they're, they're actually probably not in this crazy world of mutations, they're, they're, they're pretty legit. You know, uh, so uh, it, sometimes maybe some of the things that you develop will, will go that far. So it's just something to think about. Um, cross departmental programs and applications. So when you're starting to get more departments involved, I think that, that that's kind of more of that larger level. And large scale data denormalization and integration. Um, so that's building a larger base, right? Large base of data. Um, and so that's some of the stuff we're doing at Penn State. Um, is anybody on this level? Is anybody doing this kind of stuff? All right, good. Other mutants? When I need to connect with you, so. <laughs> um, all right, um, and I'd like to connect with any of, any of you too, so you know, you know, please get a hold of me um, um, anytime. Um, well, so let's look at some of the pros and cons of using vendor solutions. Um, the pros, obviously, with vendor solutions is uh, you know, the vendor supports it, vendor assumes the technical responsibility, um, the vendor handles the labor. All that's pretty important, it's pretty darn important. You, know, you, you have to have that with some of the stuff that you do. But some of the cons are the costs can be significant, Phase development may be slow, it may not be, but it may be. Um, input may be limited, and vendor, the vendor will have to understand your issues pretty, pretty much fully, or they've developed something that you're adapting your issues to or, or, or using for a solution that you didn't see. So just some, some food for thought. And then custom programming, you know, you've got to support the environment. The coding can be very complex. Documentation takes time. Those are, those are some of the major challenges. Um, <laughs> I missed the 800 pound gorilla on that one. That's the legacy, right? So, so that, I'll, I'll get to that here. Um, and then uh, you, you know, the pros are you know your factors. You have complete control over the development and time frames, although you know, none of us has that kind of time most of the, most of the time, but um, it can be adapted and integrated at any time. So it, you can actually prioritize what you're building and, and uh, do things as you need to do. So um, some of the benefits to my organization, um, Time savings, so our vendor output took a five day process where we used to have to put in an order for this output down to 20 minutes on a server. And the big thing, the good thing about that is that the five day process was sometimes we, we would uh, maybe select the wrong data or um, the IT department that was actually handling that would uh, lock and load some, some past data, you know, for, and so we get back a bad output. So. Um, now I have a, a server process where I just built all the algorithms on the server and just the user triggers a batch file and it just creates what they want. Um, doesn't sound like much, but at Penn State when we're dealing with, sometimes we, we will do up to 200,000 IDs through a system like that to create a big output file of, uh, we're up to 94 fields or something like that now. Um, our, our student payroll went from a two to three day of hand entering in and a little flashing screen, um, the, the pays to, you know, about an hour now because now it's a it's a uh, it's a login system. Um, that's on a good day, okay? Because uh, we have some we have some rough shifts that happen down there, so they have to check the data to make sure that the system and the, the stuff in the system actually is pretty accurate because you know it's uh, administered by students, so that's that's a challenge. Um, Cost savings is a big one, so um, like our contribution forms, you know, we generally rely on our vendors to, to make these imageable forms that we come back and scan and, and get our, our gifts from. But um, from time to time, you know, we, we might have 20, 30, um, 100 even that we, we want to do in-house because we don't want to farm it out to a vendor. Um, it's pretty rare we do, you know, I think more than 100, right? We, we, do, we do a pretty small number, but it's better than having to pay for it every time. Um, data control. So our vendor output has some very complex algorithms and it goes through all these you know, series of steps. And having that as part of our you know, uh, in-house just allows us to change that up when we want to. And we can actually change our methodology of how we're asking people for money anytime we want. So we're, we're actually testing a whole new way of asking people for money than we have in the past. Um, Having a dedicated programmer's help with solving you know, tough data integration problems such as you know, with our faculty staff reporting. So, um, 
I, I think when you have somebody who's really, really dedicated in thinking about working through something, it's a lot different than it being uh, somebody who's not sympathetic to a department. So that's part of that data control. Um, collaboration and task management. So uh, you know, that's one of the ways that our, our department's really been able to, to use our project management system to collaborate and get things done, see them on a, in a system, um, be able to stay on task. We have a data manager who religiously follows that system and if anybody gets out of line, she's really good at putting them back in line. Um, See, we have uh, our student call center application uh, tracking system helps get the students hi hires to the rigorous paperwork. I think, I think we're up to like 19 pieces of potential paperwork for any student that we hire now at Penn State. They gotta go through background checks and you know, might, might have been a little something that happened in our history that, that's uh, reflected on that, you know. Um, but uh, you know, this, this helps get people through that process and, and it sends notifications to our HR department and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a wild west, right? You know, if you're just gonna build stuff left and right. But um, I, I have some rules that I use for myself and um, just some things that I would recommend. You know, triage your documentation. I don't think you can document absolutely every line of code that you're gonna build out there. You know, that's really tough to do. But triage it, right? Figure out what, what your most important things that you need to document are. So, you know, I, uh, look at the technologies. If, I think almost everything you build, you kind of have to have to know where the technologies are and you have that documented. Security is crucial, and this is actually one of our regulations, and nobody actually policed me on this, but I, I was just going, pouring through our, our, um, our uh, policies, and I'm like, wow, this says everything that gets built in a technical spec has to be analyzed for, for you know, how it's being handled for security. So, so actually last year when I was here at Drive, I, I did a lot of that work. And you know, I went back through a lot of things I built. I'm like, oh, let's get this up to date and make sure um, I, I, I handle that. Um, critical applications, and I'd say just take your most important applications that you've built and you know, make sure that those are uh, documented to the hilt because those are the ones that, you know, if your organization is gonna be hurting without those applications, those are the ones you wanna make sure that somebody can come in and pick up. I have some other tool, uh, recommendations for people picking up, uh, you know, if, if you know, handling that, uh, that legacy issue, and that's involving others. So be inclusive, involve data-oriented people in your programming. They may not necessarily um, be applications programmers, but they might be the database people. You know, they might understand what they're looking at when they look at uh, the code. So get as many people involved in those decisions as possible. Um, use predictable patterns when, when building. So, you know, have some similar logic for everything that you build. For me, it's not very hard since it's mostly me. Um, integrate and consolidate. So, you know, for your report applications, build either a combined view or a large table that does it all. You know, that's this is something that the vendors are, are here really offering. Um, you know, they're they're trying to build this large base. Uh, I I think it's a great idea. I think you should be doing it yourself. If if and and if they're doing it, hopefully you can get to it right and and build things off of that. Because if you have that large base and something changes in your methodology, you can fix the way it's going into that base. So I highly recommend um, you know, looking at that. And we're not there yet at Penn State, but we're getting, we're in, in the annual giving office, but we're getting close. Increment and name your procedures. Uh, just makes sense, right? So that you know, everything's kind of similarly named. Um, automate your date calculations and everything you can, just makes sense. Um, use your parameters. So try to find as much stuff that takes user input um, so that things can adapt to user input. Use key ta tables for changing annual methodology. And this is one that um, is really important. So we have so many things that change up with what we do at, at Penn State that uh, we, you know, I found that it's just really good to, to key them. That's the only way that we're gonna be able to have the applications you know, you know, last over time. So I don't know, a good example is like we have uh, one of our units, for example, um, consists of nothing but alloc allocation codes. So one year to the next, that's gonna change. So we've gotta literally log all those codes in. If we're not doing it, then we're, we have a vendor that's doing a BI solution, they're gonna have to log it in, you know? So um, at least this gets you prepared for that conversation if you go to that BI tool. Optimize your aggregates and storage. Um, so we all write, code, well, most of us pretty much here write code to some degree. Um, you know, we can write some really pretty code, uh, but my advice is to uh, get rid of the pretty and just make sure it runs fast, right? So um, I've learned things like, you know, using temp tables versus using an actual table. Using an actual table is so much quicker. So if you can actually create a table and drop it within the same procedure to do a lot of your aggregate work, cut down the number of rows and that kind of stuff. It's just so much faster. And when we're dealing with, 
you know, six million gifts at Penn State, four million OHR human resource uh, pieces of data that we're bringing into our faculty staff giving. You know, it, it, you really have to figure these things out. So keep keep watching that little clock that's on your compiler and see if you can bring it down and down and down. Um, Separate out your applications. So if you're, this is for like application development. The previous stuff was more for your reporting. Um, so you know, make sure everything's in its proper folder structure. And the nice thing is when you're doing this on, on a web-based platform, you can set up different rules. You can use different delivery tools. You can use SSRS, you know, some of the things that are available for you. You might integrate with some of your vendor solutions. Um, consolidate your batch locations. Make sure you can find what, what you're doing, you know, where, where it's going on your server. Um, and then you, this one's uh, use XML and HTML, or XML, HTTP, and, and HTML. This is a recommendation I have. It's just personal because, you know, if you're building an HTML, phones use HTML. Um, you know, pre it's pretty robust, right? A lot of a lot of applications are going to use H, or a lot of uh, servers will use HTML. But the backends you, it can be all sorts of different things. It can be Python, classic ASP, .NET. So if you make the, that lookup happen uh, in a different way. Uh, in, in the server stuff, and then it comes back and infuses back into your web page. I think it's going to last over time. You can put jQuery with it. You can do all sorts of things. So that's just a little technical advice. Um, and so here's some things that, that I think are really important. Don't be afraid of ambiguity. Uh, that's one of the things I notice that happens in, in a lot of our um, exploration that you know people are afraid to admit they don't know something. But don't be afraid of that. It's, it's, you know, accept that that's part of the process. Uh, don't hide behind an automated process. So, you know, use your if you built your RFS, you know, you, you use it. But um, you know, have your automated responses say that a human being is going to get in touch with somebody. You know, and supply a, a time frame for when that's going to be. And I think that's a, that's a big one because, you know, you can easily just have that response come out and say, we we have received your request. It's in our system, and um, you know, it, it will be prioritized or whatever. But you don't want to, I don't think you want to do that. You you, you know, that's going to set a perception out there of what you're doing. So you got to watch the perception of of the level of service that you're providing. And uh, learn to split out your conversations. So this is a big one. Um, if you can take your conversations and split them apart. So take your brainstorming part, make it a separate piece, and take your analytical piece and make it separate. Because you don't want to sit there and, and you know, skeet shoot ideas, right? You don't want people's ideas to come out and just literally shoot them out of the sky. You want to be able to allow people to um, say what they want. So in order to do that effectively, you have to actually not commit to anything that somebody's saying when they're saying it. So let them go, you know, just say, hey, we're going to sit down, we're going to talk this out, you're going to talk about what you want. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions to help you get that out there. And um, as we do that, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to tell you what's involved. I'm not going to tell you um, how we're going to do it, but just do that. And, you know, just, just get out your ideas. And they may ask you, you know, when, when, when is this going to be delivered? But you got to hold them to it and just say, let's get the conversation out first and get the, get the brainstorming done first. And then when you're done with that part, impose a break. And, and after that break, then, then you can examine the pattern. So um, I'm not always the most effective at the brainstorming. I've got a colleague here who probably can, can verify that. Um, sometimes I tend to get in there and jump in. So you really have to fight that urge. But what I usually do is this next piece, which is to actually take all that input and, and look at how it fits in pattern. So you know, look at your brainstorming content, put it, uh, you know, put it in buckets, create categories. So try to see if you can boil it down to three or four different points, right? Um, you don't want to go too. You don't want to do too much. You want to see where things are conflicting. Um, look at avail available technologies as you're starting to look at those points on what's going to be the best solution, and, and then you can come up with some recommendations off of that. Uh, summarize the analysis for everybody to see. Um, so make sure that you make that that uh, conversation. You know, it's it's not just a, a, a dialogue that you're actually providing that back for everybody that was in that team meeting. Um, and then you determine the hurdles uh, that you need to overcome the needed data, the phases, and next steps. So you know, you, there may be people you're relying on to get, get your stuff back. So you've got to basically ask them for, uh, you know, for their commitment. So I'm going to finish up here. So go ahead, build some monsters and mutations. Don't forget, uh, don't forget to allow the brainstorming first. Then invite your monsters over to be part of your IT shop. Be good to them and treat them very well and maintain them and they will carry you through the day. All right, thank you. Do um, we have time for questions, Matt? Yeah. Okay, great. Does anybody have any questions? Sir? So you, you said you're um, going to be unique in your environment. You're not part of Central IT. 
right? I'm a dedicated, uh, just to rephrase your question, you, you're asking me if I'm unique in my environment, about being unique in my environment. Um, yes, I'm not part of any central IT office. I'm, I'm just literally a programmer analyst with the annual Penn State Office of Annual Giving. So um, they, uh, I have a server. It's connected to our data warehouses. I'm very, very, very cautious with how I handle that. Um, and are there other, other <clears throat> similar positions within Penn State? Are you kind of an outlier? Or have they recognized that as a, as a valuable position? To it's a great question. Like, uh, admissions and HR and other places that obviously... I think they're starting to see the value of it. Now, I, I was the, uh, my role, not me personally, it's the first outlier, I think, in, in advancement, right? So, um, the person who preceded me more, did more things in access and did like reports because they weren't agile enough with the reports that they wanted. So it just, when I came in, I ramped that way up. Um, since then, two other departments have jumped on that bandwagon and now have their own dedicated IT people. And so that's some of that cautionary stuff that I was talking about. You know, that's really important to uh, uh, keep, keep that in mind because you're gonna lose that control if you're not careful. But I think now what's happened is there's a real benefit to that, that we're all having a dialogue. And that's what the purpose of this was about, not to necessarily say, you know, custom programming is the solution, but the dialogue's gotta start about, you know, how are you gonna stay agile with serving, serving the people you do? I don't mean oh, no, that's fine. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm one of you, you people. Oh, okay. <laughs> One of the things that, that I struggle with is, is the concept of, I mean, as soon as you take something off the shelf and put it in place, yes. whether you're a network administrator or a server administrator, it's customized. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of, um, you know, oh, we're just buying something off the shelf, and so it we always, uh, as soon as it's in reality, there's, there's a level of customization. And, and hiring somebody new or a contractor or somebody who's going to be a learning curve and there's going to be yes. a and there's, at some point, that shifts into your, your, your mutant mm -hmm. situation. Right. And, it's, um, and I'm, I'm wondering if you if you thought of it in that way, and if there's a, a, a line in which you can talk about sure. to executives or to other colleagues yeah. as well as, as to when, when that makes sense and how to handle it. I think, the, I think the big key word here is temporary. You know, you don't really want to necessarily say that, you know, unless you wind up with something like Michelangelo where you can put it out to the, to the world and you do that kind of planning, that takes an incredible level of planning. Um, I really think that, that they need to know that you're there to make things work when they want it. And we've had a situation where, uh, good example is like somebody comes to our giving form and it's a 70 year old donor and they want to give 10,000 bucks and they've got IE6, right? So the developers haven't built something that works in IE6 in JavaScript. You know, and it's because IE6 isn't supported anymore. So the developer comes back and says, hey, we can't make that work. And so what we did is we created our own form, back, did a back, a back version of JavaScript that goes back to like 2000, and stuck it up you know, and said, here, you guys need to put this up you know, we, we, if you want our contract. So, so that's something that we had a real driver because we had a $10,000 donor that wasn't gonna be able to do a pledge. That was a big deal. So that word went all the way up the ladder and kind of pushed through that situation. So they understand it. They'll understand it in that context. It is very hard to explain. Um, basically, they're, they're going to follow the major, in our, off, in our area, the major gift um, area, because that's where you know, they're getting most of their data, or most, most of the money's coming in through that major gift area. So um, as long as things are being rolled out there for, for that area, and people are able to get to keep track of their prospects, there's no problem. But we're hoping at points to give them whole new things. And, and um, there are times where, like, okay, my faculty staff report's a good one. So that's one where um, our IT department couldn't produce something. So we spent time in house to do it, produced it satisfactorily, and it went up to the, to the board, uh, to the trustees of uh, Penn State. So that's where, you know, that kind of informs up. And, and um, then that gave me a foothold in for more, kind of a little more stuff that I'm able to do, right? I'm, I'm in the OHR, the human rare, uh, resource database. They're not gonna take that away with me if the trustees want the report. So I don't know, <laughs> is that helpful? <laughs> so kind of a little, little, little scattershot on that one or? <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, we'll have to talk some more, but okay. Anybody, anybody else? Thank you very much for attending my session. I appreciate it. Thanks, Thank you.